Okay, so a very warm welcome to the strategy meeting, a networking meeting of tourism and veterinary specialist groups. Um, I just want to introduce the group very briefly, and then I'm going to hand over to all of the chairs of the different working groups to introduce their, um, their specialities. So we have um, a vision for the specialist group, um, which is a future where tourism associated with protected areas has a positive impact on biodiversity, and where tourism is economically, socially, and economically sustainable. We are one of the IUCN's World Commission on Protected Areas Specialist Group, which is basically a voluntary technical network. None of the members are paid. We're all here because we really love what we're doing. Um, and we try to encourage people who are really specialists and enthusiasts on tourism and protected areas to join, to network, and to work and to collaborate together on important initiatives. So some of the things that we do, just to give an overview, is we try to develop and disseminate knowledge um, we've been told that the, the last edition of the Sustainable Tourism and Protected Areas Best Practice Guidelines is the most downloaded Best Practice Guidelines. So, good job, Paul and Steve. Um, and Glenn will be talking more about the knowledge that we generate. We also do a lot of work um, to try and build capacity, and Steve is going to talk about this. This is really his baby. And in fact, these pictures are his. <laughs> We also try and convene uh, meetings like, like this, but also in the regions where we work to try and get people together to discuss important issues around tourism protected areas. And we have a coordinating expo group, which is very vibrant, and I'm very grateful to all of them um, for all of the work they put in. We try and have weekly, um, sorry, monthly conference calls where we get together and discuss issues for the group. Um, and each member of this group works on their speciality, tries to develop activities and work with our members um, on these particular issues. Um, and we've just developed, I'll talk about that later, I'll talk about that later. In terms of our membership profile, Elena will update us a bit later, but I, my last count was we had about 266 members globally from a range of different types of stakeholder um, institutions, government, protected area authorities, students, consultants. It's, it's quite a diverse group. And with thanks to Ron Madden, who's our communications guru, um, we are trying to make ourselves much more widely spread on social media. Um, we were actually hoping that we would be able to do a live uplink with him over Google Hangout tonight so he could present the work that he's been doing. But unfortunately, the internet seems to have failed us this evening. So unfortunately, we don't think that's going to happen. So our agenda is, is very packed. Um, I'm going to invite each of our speakers to spend five minutes um, to discuss their working group activities. Um, and then we also, and then we'll have a plenary discussion about tapas. And then we're going to have um, two speakers from um, outside the campus Expo. We've got Penny Blicker and David Stewart, who are going to go and talk about their very important global initiatives. And then finally, we're going to, so I'm going to invite some comments on um, the next 10 year strategy for tapas and give some reflections on what we've done so far. And then if there are any snacks left. Okay, so thanks very much. So first of all, I'd like to invite Glenn to come off and speak at lunch. Thanks very much, Anna, and uh, great to see such a great turnout. Uh, going around is a sheet of paper that we would love to have you identify yourself and your contact details so that we can contact you in the future about what TAPS is doing and how to become a member. Uh, Ralph Buckley and I uh, are leading the Knowledge Development and Dissemination Group. Um, in some ways, it's a public face of TAPS for the, the products that uh, come out of this group. And, uh, since I joined that group about four years ago, we've, we've uh, gone through a few uh, activities. Um, after recruiting many members, we contacted all of those who were interested in the knowledge dissemination side. And we uh, got their uh, ideas together um, and tried to prepare uh, a set of priorities. And we tried to pursue them as best we could within the capabilities we had and the uh, interests that we had. So our first uh, key production was... Uh, 
special issue of the Parks Journal that Liz helped with anyway, Liz, and uh, I co-edited. We're proud to say that was the, the only and probably uh, unique uh, issue that was uh, dedicated to one topic, that was tourism and the uh, AG targets. So there are many extra copies available over here, so please help yourself. This is what it looks like. It's also uh, available online so you can download it. Uh, Ufe will talk about the uh, upcoming revised third edition of the best practice guidelines, and has mentioned that already. And, uh, sorry? I thought you are talking Okay, I'll talk about it. Uh, this has been a, a two year effort, and uh, it will be publicly launched on Monday night, right here, at 7. No, not at 4 no. At 4 a.m., I'm sorry. Uh, Monday night. So this has been a, an amazing uh, process involving four editors, 54 contributors from 60 different countries or so, 20 some different countries, and uh, it uh, falls on the heels of the second edition that uh, Paul and Steve and uh, Chris Haynes uh, produced, and we're pleased to uh, bring it up to uh, 2014, 2015 when it will be published. So uh, we'll introduce that on Monday, but here's a sneak peek of the yeah. new copy. It just has to go through the IUCN review process before it will be made available. So uh, those are some of the things that we're working on. We've kind of ridden a little bit of a wave and uh, we need to resurrect ourselves and so we'll be identifying some new priorities and attracting new members and developing new projects. Uh, projects. So we invite you to express your interest in uh, tourism in general and in the knowledge dissemination part. So these are the uh, versions. We've also had a special issue of the Kudu Journal uh, coming out of South Africa. I saw a copy of that. Steve, do you have that? There, Steve and Anna Spensley. Oh, good. Okay. They were the, the special editors of that one. Good. <laughs> And uh, so next steps for this group, we want to invite new members, we want to make uh, a concerted effort to consult everybody to develop new priorities, make sure that that connects with what IUCN and TAPS and WCPA are doing, and uh, collaborate uh, with members within our group and well beyond as well. And uh, we, were all, we are always looking for connections and partnerships that can uh, produce some uh, resources for what we need to do. With that, thank you very much. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you. Uh, if you don't want to carry heavy books home, you are welcome to grab one of these uh, thumb drives, memory sticks that contain all of these things, plus more. And uh, we'll announce what more is on Monday night sessions, <laughs> manuals, and the like. So, thank you very much. Good evening. It's great to see so many people out here concerned about how we're going to take care of these parks, how we're going to manage all the people who want to come out and see them. Okay? Uh, it's been my pleasure to work in this area since Paul Eagles what about 1997 or something the first task force started this and Paul asked me to come on huh? before me it was oh. uh, Hector so oh it was, Hec it was Hector and then Paul now Ann but I've been a while since I've been uh, participating so it's great to see this increased interest basically uh, and I don't have a PowerPoint, so it won't be death by PowerPoint. My fault, anyway. What we what we do in this capacity uh, building aspect is try to address the question: Is what do we do to uh, build the capability of the stewards of protected areas in order to manage tourism and visitation? 
what, what do we need to do, and then what can we do to do that. That's our orientation. And one of the things, uh, and there's a kind of an overlap between our uh, our particular subgroup and uh, the one that Glenn and Ralph Buckley work on. And one of the things we did uh, was produce just recently a special issue of Kudu, which is, uh, and Anna was part of this. She and I worked together, which was a real pleasure to, to work with her. Uh, this, uh, the idea behind this, and by the way, Kudu comes out of South African national parks. So uh, we went to South African national parks and for the proposal to prepare a special issue with their journal on tourism that would lay a foundation for some of the discussions that we're having here today. So it just I don't know, came out in June or July or something like that. So this is one of two issues. It'll be this one will be on the plane to Missoula. So uh, you'll have to wait until you can get home or open up the, the thumb drive to get it. So anyway, so that's one of the things we do to help build capacity. Uh, but there's some very specific things that, that you can do right now in this particular area. And let's see. Um, some of you may know that WCPA has a whole um, competency register that's being uh, developed. Mike Appleton is in charge of that particular competency register. And there's a section on tourism. I had a chance to review some of that about a year and a half ago. And it's still a work of art. So we need people to get engaged in these kinds of efforts. You folks, otherwise, other people are going to be identifying the competencies that we think that and it may not be the same competencies that we think are important. So that's one thing you can do. Another thing, which is just more recent, see, Glenn Ritchie? Glenn, are you here? From, okay, from the University of Rhode Island. He is leading an effort to establish a book of knowledge that's related back to these competencies. And that book of knowledge is, is source material for the competencies, all right? And um, that is still pretty much in the beginning. And by source materials, I mean anything from a lecture you academics might have organized. Oh, I'm getting the hook here, but I'm just about done. A lecture that um, you might have given to the new best practice guidelines, okay, that need to be entered into a database, and it's up to you to do it. I've, I've entered 25 or 30, so they would have something to demonstrate, but we really need people to demonstrate that tourism is its own substantive area of knowledge, and it's important to the competencies that managers need. So, the last thing I will say, and then I'll get down, is that we need to do uh, some of our own needs assessments. And we need to have you engaged in, in helping us understand what does it take to manage tourism and visitation in protected areas. You know, I'm standing up here, I'm kind of doing that now. Now that's a North American perspective. I can't represent all your perspectives. So you folks, when we call upon you, to just spend a few minutes responding to some of these emails. If one of you, if each of you, just contributed one thing to the book of knowledge, just one thing, just think how, many, how expansive that book of knowledge would get. Ten minutes is all it takes. So I'll, uh, I'll leave you uh, with that, okay? And uh, we're going to move forward on this project. So.
Thanks, Anna, and um, I'm going to talk to you now about World Heritage and Healthy People, Healthy Parks, Healthy People, but one of my other portfolios is about networking, and um, so in that capacity, firstly, uh, welcome to Sydney. Secondly, uh, welcome to Baramadigal land and, and let us pay our respects to our traditional owners of this land. Thirdly, my apologies because if I'd done a better job, perhaps we might have been a stream or even a cross-cut theme. But yet again, another World Parks Congress and we're still not there. But we fight on. And so like Steve and like Paul, we're some of the, the old grey-haired folk that have been trying for a while to make this topic one that's seen as being central, not peripheral. Um, and we continue to, to, to try and get that message out. Um, in relation to World Heritage, I've got a few things that I would like to share with you. Firstly, apologies for Peter Debrain, who is the tourism program manager for UNESCO World Heritage Centre. He's not here in Sydney. Um, he'd very much like to be, but he did ask that his apologies be sent to everyone. Uh, to let you know that um, the report on World Heritage and Sustainable Tourism Strategy, which has got quite a, a long history, um, precedes Peter, uh, came to a head with a meeting in Magau, uh, which a number of us attended, uh, and formulation of some principles of what World Heritage and Sustainable Tourism should look like, um, but that report eventually went on to the World Heritage Committee and was adopted, and it's now become a, a strategy known as People Protecting Places, and um, quite a lot of work has been done in particular by Peter and um, James Redbank in researching and developing uh, a set of guidelines called the How-To Tools. Uh, there was a workshop that a number of us attended in May this year in China at a World Heritage Site in Hong Sun, um, looking at developing South-South collaboration, which is, I guess, a nice shift um, in terms of the way that some of these partnerships are formed in the past, so this is much more um, uh, Asia-centric. But it was a workshop in which we were looking at um, providing some feedback on these tools that have been developed. The tools have been tested by the uh, Nordic and Baltic region, and they are about to be tested in Africa, starting with Victoria in uh, December, Victoria Falls in December, and next year an additional three sites. Uh, what Peter would like you all to do is to go to that site and have a look at the materials. Um, this is the, 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 the landing page for that site, and you'll see um, down here that there are 10 uh, guides that have been developed. And the, the idea behind these tools is to assist um, destinations, to assist World Heritage Site managers, to assist communities living in, working near, part of World Heritage Sites, to understand the, the tourism relationship better and to also understand how to make tourism work in the service of the people, the place, and the heritage of those places. This portal and this site is going to be publicly launched um, at the beginning of next year. Um, and what Peter would very much like all of you to do is to have a look at the site, have a look at the guidelines, and to provide any feedback that you would like to give him on those site, on those guides. And if when you have a look at the guides, you think, oh, look, I, I've got a case study that would really help to illustrate some of those points or to um, add to the material that already exists, then Peter would be delighted, I'm saying this, Peter would be delighted to be flooded with emails. No, he really would like your feedback. Um, he's looking for any inputs and any case study materials to enrich 
and make the the, um, the portal more more useful and more relevant. So um, if um, I guess Anna will be loading these materials up in various. You saw the long list of multimedia. I am seriously old and seriously wedded to emails and pencils, not to all the new media, but others much better at doing it. So Anna will make sure you can get access. Peter would also like you to know that there is a conference coming up in the new year in February. Uh, it's joint between UNESCO and the World and the World Tourism Organisation. And if you go to that website, you'll see the details of that conference. The other um, area that I'm just covering very quickly is about healthy parks and healthy people. We had a session the other day and I spoke about this. Uh, increasingly, the connection between uh, well-being, good health um, of, of people and the connection to our, our environment using green exercise and parks as a perfect venue for doing that has become something that is increasingly um, attracting attention of a range of government agencies, international agencies. It, it, the, the early research began in the UK, then the Australian Parks Agency, Parks Victoria, picked it up, uh, sort of branded it and gave it the name Healthy Parks, Healthy People. They ran a conference, they commissioned a very large report and pulled together the research that's been done in the area. Since then, a lot more has been done. They also have a good website and portal. They're keen to get people engaged. Paul Eagles and myself are part of that task force. Um, they, IUCN sees the importance of this. They've adopted it as a part of the IUCN programs. There is a stream here at the conference they are developing guidelines that would very much like the input of experts like yourselves to the guidelines. So if you're available, 8.30 a.m., that should be a.m. on them, 8.30 a.m. on Tuesday, they're going to be going through the guidelines and looking at ways in which they can partner between uh, health professionals, park managers and tourism professionals. Thank you very much for your time. Um, and on the issue of um, tourism not being a stream or a cross-cutting issue, I just checked on the tourism journey, which you should have one in your chest. There are at least 80 tourism events yes, taking we had, place. We had some success, just not the major success. Yeah. And those are just individuals. Some of them have got extra presentations in them. So, so congratulations to all of those. So next I'd like to welcome um, Susanna. Elena, I think. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Elena. Elena. Elena's going to go up. She's our membership coordinator. Thank you very much, Anna. And uh, hello, everybody. My name is Elena. So since 2013, I'm membership coordinator of Tapaz Group. So if any of you um, is not a member yet in this room and want to become a member, please feel free to email me, contact me, and I'll explain you the whole process. And so the whole presentation is about how to join. It's just five slides. <laughs> so, and actually I wanted to add that this, this is a great pleasure for me to be here and to meet those people, members, with whom I was in touch by email before that, and now I saw and I met you here, so it's really nice to be here. Okay, so how to become a member, <laughs> how to join the group. So actually, the main membership criteria, we don't, want you, we don't need any professional skills or anything. It's just interest in tourism, protected areas, and biodiversity conservation. It's great if you have experience, but even if you have just interest, you're very welcome to join. Uh, you should support the TAPAS group's vision and objectives, and be willing to volunteer time for some activities of TAPAS group. Uh, and actively participate on at least one working group. And this is what is my main role, as I can see, try to make, not, a, not only invite members, but try to make them more active. And we'll have some working groups of those people who want to do something, make a difference. So uh, the membership process is very easy. There is an online application this is, that is available on this link. So you should just go there, fill out the form. I will receive this form and look through 
your interest or experience, uh, we'll send you confirmation and welcome email and some more information about Tapas, and then you're welcome to join and actively participate. So, uh, what else I'll be, I'll be doing? I'll put information about you in the database. We have a private database for EXCO members of TAPAS with all your details that you fill in while completing the form. And we also create a public database with very limited contact information, just your na name, where are you from, so that we all know how diverse our group is. And again, just become a member. So, there are certain membership benefits. Uh, if you join a group, it's an exchange of dialogue and information. And I can tell you that since I became a member of TAPAS group, to me, it was always like constant learning and constant exchange of experience, especially when I became an EXCO member and we have these hangouts every month with Anna and others. For me, it's always constant learning and I learn about new events, new conferences and just what the work is being done by different people all over the world. So Tapas Group is a great opportunity to know about this. Uh, sharing research information, uh, you can come up with some joint publications on tourism and protected areas theme. And you can also have access to IUCN Union portal with information about other TAPAS members and Google Group. I also forgot to mention that when you become a member, the next email you receive is an invitation to join TAPAS Google Group. And this is our main communication platform. And sometimes, as a TAPAS member, you get some discounted prices for some social, web workshops and webinars. Not all the times, but it's possible. And the last thing I wanted to talk about is our new membership strategy. So the first strategy was developed by Elizabeth and colleagues, and Elizabeth is the previous membership uh, director. She's right there in the end of the room, and I'm very thankful to her for all the advice she gave me. So uh, the first strategy was developed for 2010-2014, so now it's the time to update it. And so we were working for several months on the new membership strategy with NSU, uh, Ron, Len, and everybody who's involved, and Steve, everybody who's involved in TAPAS activities. And now it's finally finished, and uh, I would like to take this opportunity to officially launch it <laughs> and to say that we will publish, we will have it online. You have, you'll be able to read the strategy. The main difference is that in 2010 strategy, there were two different types of members, associate members and full members. Associate members meant that you had, uh, if, you're, you, if you were not a member of WCP uh, World Commission of Protected Areas, you could also only be an associate member. If you wanted to be a full member, you should have been a WCP member. Now we decided it's not needed. <laughs> and now you can only send your application and become a full member of TAPAS group, which is more easy. <laughs> so that's, this is it. Thank you so much. And just contact me in case you have any questions about membership. Thank you so much. Uh, I should mention that right now we have 266 members and I think uh, the number increased from 18 members uh, five years ago to 266 members that are now. So we're, we're really working. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> presentations in a row. I'm um, one of the new committee working with um, and then okay, I'll do yeah. And just before minutes. I forget to say so, um, after this session, please feel free to talk to any of the EXCO members about if you want to join, if you want to be part of one of the working groups. Come and speak to us if you want to start a new working group that might make the, the group even richer. Thank you. Evening, everybody. Um, just on the learners things, while well, the bookmarks are on your seats and there are some more over there, I've got the membership URL you are on them if you want to get a quick access to it. Okay. Yes, sorry, then your face just reminded me. The list is going around. If you could just fill in your name and you um, details on there just as a sort of registration of who you all attended the event. Okay, so this is the official launch of the community working group. We are just starting it now, so I'm glad you all could be part of it. So just to give you some of the objectives of this new working group, it is to connect all TAPAS members who are working in fields related to benefit sharing, um, community engagement, community development. Um, as I think anyone who's been in any of the sessions at the Congress would have noticed, the importance of engaging communities, living around protected areas, 
and involved in tourism. And that's why the, we just felt that this group was really important to try and connect everyone working in those fields. And to promote individual research on benefit sharing, as well as the socio-economic impacts of tourism, positive and negative, and to try and encourage researchers from around the world to do comparable, comparative studies, and then to collaborate on research about benefit sharing mechanisms. I think the only way protected areas are going to survive in the long run, as we have been discussing over the last few days, is if communities benefit. So we need to assess which um, benefit sharing mechanisms are the best to use and in what circumstances. And then the final ultimate goal of this for me is to develop guidelines um, on benefit sharing and best practice when engaging with communities. So as we have guidelines for sustainable tourism, to have separate guidelines specifically related to two communities. And so who should join? Anyone interested in working at all working in the field of benefit sharing or community development um, from tourism and protected areas? And any researchers and practitioners from all around the world, whether academia, private sector, government, I uh, really would like a nice mix. Because I think the more um, different sectors that we have, um, the more diverse the ideas will be and the better we can produce research and guidelines from that. And so just how to join, obviously, um, you need to, if you're not a member of TAPIS, you need to chat to Elena first and become a member of TAPIS. And then you can send me an email. Um, otherwise, send Elena an email and ask her to put you in contact with me. And um, there's just a few questions that I won't go through them now, but we'll just find out exactly where you're working and what you're doing, just to get a better idea of people who are joining that way. But I hope that there are lots of you here that will join, because I think it really can be a fantastic group. So thank you for that. And then just quickly to give you a bit more information on the tourism journey. So as um, we've been discussing, Robin and Anna, and everyone this evening, we've tried to integrate tourism as much as possible into as many areas as we could. And so we developed the tourism journey, which was on your seat if um, you were not sitting. Otherwise, they are on the table over there. And what that offers you is a detail of all the tourism-related events, presentations, and posters. And there's a long version, um, which is a few pages, which includes presenters and then there's a shorter version that just has the event and the venue and um, just in terms of tapas um, events so we had a couple already on um, Thursday we had tourism as a nature based solution then tourism in transplant to protected areas and um, today there was a tourism conservation partnerships at lunchtime and then obviously this evening's event and then on Monday the publications launch so we have all tapas um, events, so I hope that I know I've seen a lot of your faces at a lot of them, so that's been great. We're also on Twitter, so the hashtag of Tourism, and if you go there, anyone who's not familiar with Twitter is not also learning Twitter, you just click on the hashtag and it gives you all the feed on um, related tourism events at the Congress. And we will hang out, um, and I mentioned them earlier, we will be having um, them loaded up and recorded sessions as well as various other thing else uh, as we go along in webinars. Um, we're going to be doing a type of summary document from the Congress related to all the events that will have all the links to all the presentations that have been related to tourism, um, any other interesting documents. So um, if you are a TAPAS member, you will be informed of all of those. And then we've got a special issue which I'll talk about just now that's going to come out related to the Parks Congress. Just in terms of the publications for Monday and that are related to the TAPAS groups, um, the Best Practice Guidelines in Sustainable Tourism will be launched on Monday, the Tourism Concessions and Protected Areas, uh, the Protected Area Tourism Concessions and Toolkit, the Tourism Concessions Guidelines for Transfrontier Conservation Areas, and the Special Edition of Kudu and the Special Edition of Parks. Um, so yeah, quite an exciting event on Monday, so we hope to see you all there as well. So the special edition is from the Journal of Tourism and Hospitality Research. Um, myself and Anna are the guest editors, and what we're going to be looking at is Tourism in Protected Areas, a review of the past decade, so since the last Parks Congress. Um, and we're looking for abstracts and papers that are related to one of the theme um, streams of the Congress. So if you are interested, if you can send either Anna or myself an abstract by the end of December that ties your paper into one of the streams of the Congress, and then the papers are due at the end of January. So there's a bit of a tight timeline, but hopefully with your presentations you've got something already in place. But if you want to chat to any of us, feel free. And enjoy the tourism journey.
I just want to go back a bit because I, I mentioned earlier that we tried to get Ron Madden um, online to give his presentation. Um, and I just wanted to reflect a bit on the efforts that he've made because he really has made a substantial um, contribution to this group. Um, he's taken um, people like me and, and Glenn and Steve who didn't know what a Google Hangout was and how to do it. Um, and we've been having online chats, they've been uploaded to YouTube, which is very frightening the first few times because you don't know who's going to watch it. Um, and <laughs> he, he's, been, he's even got me using Twitter. I'm still learning, and Sue's giving me lessons, and so are other people that meet my book. But he's done an amazing job in getting us going on Facebook, um, and the LinkedIn group has been led by Paul Eagles. Uh, but thank you very much, Paul, for setting that up too. Um, and Ron also runs the Planeta Wiki, he has a, a page dedicated to Tapas and others too. So he's going to take all the recordings we've done and the links to SlideShare throughout this Congress, and he's going to be um, sharing them widely through the media as far as possible to make sure that as many people as possible, especially those who could not afford and were able to get to CB can actually learn from some of the things that took place. So I'd like to give a clap to Ron. Okay, so um, next I'd just like to spend a few minutes, I'd like to invite um, the EBSCO members back onto the stage. I'd like to just see if there are any questions um, from anybody here about the group, um, any of us, sorry, <laughs> answer. Um, and I'd like to open the floor. So um, Sue and Steve and Glenn and uh, Robin, Elena, if you could come up here please for just 10 minutes. I don't know, I'm not sure if you said it or not, but about the portal uh, of, uh, that is going to be launched soon that talks about tourism close to places of cultural heritage, etc. How do we give the feedback? Uh, where is it uh, in order to check it out and maybe if we have any comments, give them to Thanks. Yes, there was a, um, the website The website for the portal I gave, and then at the end I gave you an email address for Peter Debreen at UNESCO, if you speak to me afterwards. But as Anna said, all of these PowerPoint presentations will be loaded up on our Facebook page and various sites, so they will be there, so if people are looking for them. But it's Peter Debreen at uh, UNESCO, uh, UNESCO.org. It was all very clear. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'd like to thank all of the EXCO members as well for all their work. Thank you. And can I also ask everyone to, a round of thanks to Anna because Anna, as the chair of the group, has to chase us, <laughs> round us all up, deal with various time zones and people's busy agendas and it takes a huge amount of time. Anna's got her own life, her own job, her own family, a little baby and she still manages to find time to do all of the things for all of us. So thank you very much, Anna. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the next part of our agenda, which is really to invite um, David Stewart to come and talk on the CBD and then Kelly Griffiths to talk about the GSDC. So, David, I'd like to Sorry. <laughs> um, so my name is David Storm, as Anna said. I am the Business Biodiversity uh, Program Officer for CBD. Um, one reason I'm here is I'm actually uh, representing my colleague Oliver Hulo, I think some of you know. And, but also, um, Oliver and I have been actually working very closely on these files because we've realized at CBD that ecotourism is a huge business sector and so it's vital to have that in the business, uh, 
business engagement strategy. So we are collaborating with my code science. So what I've been asked to do today in a very brief amount of time is just to talk about some of the developments of um, the recent COP, the uh, COP for the parties, from CBD, but we held in Pyeongchang, uh, Korea, about two weeks ago, which is another reason why I'm jet lagged. I, I just recovered from Korea and got here, so it's I'm all over the place. Um, some of you were at the event, uh, I guess it was two days ago, where I did actually mention um, the COP results. What I want to do here is just talk about a few of the other things that we did. So, um, so basically, one of the main features we had at the uh, call was a uh, side event on tourism and sustainable use. This was part of a larger business forum. And uh, just to give a bit of background, in the past what we've done at COPS is had um, various individual side events, at the, um, uh, including business and tourism, at the COPS where it's been scattered. This time we want to provide a space for business to actually input, and we decided to put tourism with that. And actually it was received very, very well. We got a lot of positive results. We actually got a lot more input into the tourism section because there was a concentration with business and the party, so we were very, very pleased with that. Um, as Oliver informed me, because he was running the section, there were um, 30 participants, uh, including 12 parties, so 12 countries that were involved. And we did see that quite a number of people who had actually not registered originally actually stayed on, were very interested and very engaged, so we were very, very pleased about that. The participants included uh, park managers and CBD focal points, which is very important because they are actually getting engaged in the process. Uh, various tourism and conservation interests, NGOs, researchers, academics, other project managers, and actually other business interests as well. Again, there was a lot of cross-interest in this, so this was really good. The way um, that, was, that panel was divided, this was part one of four parallel sessions um, that day at business forum. But within that tourism section we had four panels. They were on tourism financing, integrating biodiversity into the um, development of tourism, tourism and conservation hotspots, biodiversity and challenge of blue green tourism development, and tourism as an alternative livelihood for um, indigenous and uh, indigenous peoples and communities. And again we found we had very, very active uh, participation, a lot of feedback, a lot of responses, and it actually helped feed into the COP decision and have actually helped inform the, um, the work that we will be doing post COP in the new section. Now, one of the um, big features of this, and one of the things that's come out of COP and we're going to be looking at, is the revision of the CBD user's guide. So, as, you, um, as you're aware of the CBD guidelines, which were put forward, I believe, in 2004, and then in 2007 there was a user's manual. And the decision has been made that the user's manual is going to be updated. And Oliver and I have been talking about this. Oliver is obviously leading on this with uh, people. But um, one of the things that was uh, came out of the discussion were some of the elements that they felt that needed to be actually improved in the manual. And I'm just going to go through these, but one of the um, reasons I'm presenting this slide here is um, Oliver has asked if the tapestry actually input into this. Um, is this complete? Is it something that needs to, are there other things that are not on this list that need to be included? Are there things on this list that maybe shouldn't be included? Um, so we really are looking for input. This is not a fixed and still thing. This is suggestions that came out. We are looking for more suggestions. So this is sort of, if you like, um, tourism side event part two here in Australia. Um, and trust me, it's warmer here than it was in Georgia. So um, some of the things that we really need are First of all, we have to be clear about who the audience is. Uh, is it going to be local authorities? Who will be the users? Whose responsibility is it to implement the guidelines? The last edition, my understanding was it was a little bit fuzzy about who the audience was, and so it was trying to be all things to all people. I think we need to have folks a little bit more narrow. We have to take into account, into account practical issues that affect tourism development and the private sector. And we have to make sure we're looking at how the private sector uh, impacts on this, but how also the local people in the business. Indigenous peoples local communities are actually impacted in how they uh, play into that as well. And um, we have to give priority to increased communication feedback and voluntary reporting on the implementation of the guidelines is vital. This is something we've been missing before. We really need to improve on that. The reporting was a theme that came out of the business forum in general, the tourism especially. It's very, very important. We have to identify a small number of uh, actions for CBD parties to take. I guarantee if you give them a large number of actions, they won't do them. A small number, it's really hard, but if we give them concrete actions, they will actually have a chance of moving forward. And we have to invite a wide range of players to, to cooperate on biodiversity and tourism development. 
I said these were the main ideas, suggestions that came out of this, but I would invite anyone if you've got outdoor ideas, uh, I'd like to improve on these ads for this program, to either um, speak to me now or to um, uh, contact both myself and Oliver and, and uh, give us some suggestions. And I'll give you our emails at the end of the, uh, the slide. What do you homework um, So with the with the Yosef's Guide, uh, the, um, I won't read this through, but this is the proposed chapter headings that we would have, uh, proposed contents. And again, I would invite people to look at this, and this would be made available in some, um, online too. So again, if there are suggestions, if there are ideas about how to move this forward and what else to do, we would invite your input. This is really important. The only other thing I'd add, uh, I'm not going to slide on this, this is my whole presentation, was the idea that the COP decision itself, the COP12, we had a very strong decision on tourism, and it's given us a really good mandate to work for, to move forward and work. Now, I explained that the last thing, I haven't brought the slides in again, uh, but those can be made available. Hannah has those available, and I can send those to people if they need them. But again, we're looking for collaboration. We actually have funding for the years, and we're looking for proposals to actually take advantage of that funding. So, in terms of input of the user's manual, um, work on um, concessions, public-private partnerships, blue green economy, other issues like that. We are really looking for those as we seek input and we really want to move this forward. It has to be collaborative. We want to make sure the CBD is a, um, is a facilitator that brings together the ideas and we want to bring together the expertise as we work together and ensure that this is going properly. So thank you very much. I can be contacted at david.sturman at cbd.int. Um, just by um, first name dot last name at cbd.int. So Oliver, for those who don't know him, Oliver, O L I V E R dot P L L H I L L E L at cbd.int. And we both be very happy to work with you, and uh, we are looking to work with us together. So we're happy to work with the Tapas Group and we look forward to the collaboration. Thank you very much. Ask any questions. Are there any questions or any comments? Well, can you comment about the visitor? You mentioned two things at, that caught my eye for the early presentation. One was concessions. The other was visitor monitoring data. Right. Um, I don't. I'll, I'll be honest. I don't have a lot of information on that. I do know that it's a project we're looking at, and we are. We do want to quantify the data more. Um, I have to get Oliver to give you a bit more detail on it, but it is a project we are looking at. It's something that the Germans, we have some German money and some, uh, some, there's some Jeff funding and EU funding, and I know some of these projects are looking at. Visitor modeling, visitor impact numbers and such is something we really want to look at. We want to quantify the impacts and also look how that's going. So that's something that we are looking at doing, and uh, again, we'd be very interested in collaborating on that. Okay, um, any other questions? Thank you very much, Dave. Thank you very much. Okay, um, and next I'd like to invite Kelly Bricker up to come and talk to us about the Global Sustainable Tourism Fund. <laughs> Thank you, Anna, and good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to do a very fast uh, overview of what the GSTC is, if you haven't heard about it in the past. And I also, if you're interested, I have a draft of our upcoming business plan. Uh, Anna was a very active member of the GSTC, so I want to acknowledge that. And some of you may actually be involved in working groups, so um, hopefully... If not now, by the end of this, you'll be involved. So. so I I currently serve as the vice chair and the treasurer. Um, it's hats that you're given; they kind of rotate around with it. <laughs> so, but, um, but I've been involved with the GSTC actually since the the Mohunk uh, Mount. We had, a, we had a meeting on certification way back in 2000. Um, but since then, the GSTC has become a 501c3 and uh, is off and running. So, uh, a non-profit organization, officially, yes. Yeah. In, the, in the U.S., that's what we call it. 
Um, I also wear the hat of uh, shepherding the International Ecotourism Society's conference every year, so I, I'm going to make a quick plug for them. It'll be in Quito, Ecuador in April of 2015. Uh, we're still putting together panels and presentations, so if you have an opportunity uh, to join us in Ecuador, we'd love to have you. So what is the, what is the GSTC? Um, it, it really is the, uh, with, with help from organizations that are sitting in this audience tonight and organizations all over the world, it is really um, setting the standards for sustainable tourism in, in what it can be and what we hope it is in the future. Um, we have, as I mentioned, global support behind the GSTC. Um, includes everything from very uh, high-level organizations such as the UN's, uh, NGOs, IUCN is a, a supporter, Rainforest Alliance, universities all over the world. Uh, certainly the private sector is a critical stakeholder in the GSTC. And then we have travel trade associations. Um, and, and what we're trying to do is really uh, create an opportunity to define and take care of some of the mud uh, that's out there surrounding sustainable tourism and what it should be in our industry. Um, so we have uh, criteria, the, the most recent criteria that's been developed is for destinations and that's been a very uh, useful criteria in helping to organize uh, how destinations actually communicate. Uh, we feel like operating in isolation via a hotel or a tour operator really isn't going to make the difference that we need to do with this industry. So we're pretty excited about the destination criteria. We had several early adopters to try and use it and give us feedback. And of course, uh, we had all kinds of groups using this criteria, everybody from small towns to small islands to national parks. Um, the, the criteria was, was really vetted by all the criteria of the good work that's being done worldwide. I think initially there was 6,000, 6 to 7,000 criteria actually looked at. And what it was really sifted down to is the critical pieces that are global in nature and can apply to a, a variety of circumstances around the world. Um, and these are all based on very defined pillars of sustainability, which include the management uh, to economic, social, cultural, and of course environmental. Um, what the criteria are right now are criteria that have worldwide applicability with indicators that support them in a regional context, to, to park context, to a, a very specific idea surrounding the, the context in which people work. Um, so it, it spans the gamut from small to large um, and geographic. Um, and also using uh, the criteria, what we hope uh, is that it raises issues surrounding sustainable tourism and we want people to distribute them widely. They're on the website, you can use them, you can download them, you can uh, use them with uh, a whole variety of indicators that support each of the criteria. Um, we've seen them used in classrooms uh, for students studying sustainable tourism all the way to uh, government levels. So really being used overall by a wide range of stakeholders. Um, we're also incorporating these into training materials. We've got a, a training program on the criteria that can be done uh, and also a destination uh, criteria training program. Um, it's also been used as a checklist to see how you're measuring up or how an entity might be measuring up and to provide guidance in getting started and getting your foot in the door in sustainable tourism. Um, we've also seen it uh, used to create local standards to not reinvent the wheel but to use something that's been vetted uh, quite heavily and use it out there in the marketplace. And lastly, um, the we're using the criteria to, to begin work on subsectors as well. We know that there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, so we have these core activities. We also have um, a verification program for certification programs. And this verification program started back with the Mohonk Agreement um, to really look at how we can and use the gold standard that's being used out there in certification programs 
to really push sustainability forward and verify that that the primary principles are being met. Um, this is just an example from the website. This is the early adopter program that was used on the destination criteria. So we've used it in a lot of different contexts. We have some really good case studies and stories um, on the website to go to. Uh, we're now doing uh, training for this destination management and it can be incorporated at, at a variety of levels. And we know that it, it's working and it's moving uh, sustainable tourism forward in a variety of destinations currently. Um, and the criteria are in multiple languages. We're continuing to work on that. So um, there's, there's a lot of access that, that can be used. Um, and how you can engage, this is sort of wrapping up. Um, we'd really like people to get familiar with the criteria continually to provide feedback. They get reviewed every three years. Uh, it's quite a quite a endeavor, as you can imagine. So we, we take those comments very seriously and, and incorporate them into uh, reviewing the criteria every three to five years. Um, we love you to be an ambassador for the GSTC and, and help organize training courses on, on what the criteria and the indicators involve. Um, and we also, if you're a certification body or have access to certification, we'd like them to take a look at the criteria to ensure that certification is doing what it can do uh, in the marketplace. Um, other ways you can, if you're in the public sector, we, we'd love for you to use the tools and services that are available at, at, at no charge on the website. We'd also like you to uh, support certification in your, in your locales, uh, where it's working and where it's doing good work. If you're a private company, um, you don't, we don't believe that certification is the only venue to uh, sustainable tourism, but it is uh, the gold standard and we'd like people to start looking at the criteria and start using it and, and get recognized if you're a certification body. Um, and NGO and ed educators, we've got an intro to the GSTC download, um, so if, you're, if you'd like to learn more about it, it's certainly a tool that you can use. Um, in summary, um, we are there for the, the globe and the planet, and we hope that uh, people start getting familiar with it. We feel like the GSTC has legs, and it's starting to be used in a variety of contexts, and we'd love to get your involvement. It's a volunteer organization, like many of these, and uh, we love the input that we're getting from working groups, from education to uh, communications, and there's a lot of ways to get involved, and I'd be happy to talk about those later. Thanks, Kelly. Um, and I'd just like to reflect that from my time working with Kelly on the board and on the destination work group, there is a huge amount of volunteer effort that goes into the GSTC, so I welcome you to support them. Um, we'd like to take some questions for Kelly, if there are, on the GSTC or even on ties. Yeah. I have a question. Is it possible to be certified directly by the by, by this council? Or there are many certificates on the world. Right. So there there is not very clear for the destinations or product where to certify. Right. So it's not possible directly to certify with you? Uh, no. The GSTC is a supporter of certification bodies. So what, what it does do is recognize those certification groups that are out there and doing good work. Um, so they get recognized and we would say if you want to get certified, go with the recognized certification body. There's over 150, I think we're up to 180 different certification bodies out there in various ways, shapes, and forms. There's only a couple of destination certification bodies, but these are becoming, it's becoming more recognized that this could have real value in uh, moving sustainability in this, in this part, in this tourism sector. Um, well, uh, I am from Chile. Uh, we did the process, we developed our own certification system for accommodations and we were recognized by the GSTC yes. in February uh, 2014. Um, 
we are just beginning our way with destinations and uh, I'm not really sure if it will work same as with product certifications in the way that you will as well recognize them and you said that there were two of them recognized if you tell us about them or, or about the destinations or, um, or not I understood that I don't know. um yeah there's there there are destinations that have gone through the early adopter pro process and I think there's probably about 16 different destinations that are still going through it um at various uh, ways one is uh, Riviera Maya and they are actually holding a, uh, in this December, they're holding sort of a united front about the destination work that they're doing in a training. So it's really helped. I think what the destination criteria does is it helps groups organize around sustainability and gets that, that initiative started in destinations that don't have a, a mechanism or an organization to help do that. And so that's where we're seeing it being used. The next steps for Riviera Maya, for example, are to do a training and get more stakeholders involved and in, in understanding the GSTC. So now they can bring in hotels and tour operators and really make the destination more focused on sustainability principles. So there are uh, highlighted all of our participants um, from Mount Guangzhou and in, in China to um, to Riviera Maya to Chile, um, so all of the folks that have participated in that early adopter program, their profile is up and their information is there. And if you're interested in that and you want to hear how the process actually impacted their destinations, Jackson Hole, Wyoming is another one, and they're off and running in in ways that uh, that are really new and innovative. So I would. I would say look at those. There's probably somebody in your region. Um, they're pretty global overall, and they're they're used as great examples and great context, and they're willing to share their stories on what's working with respect to that. So, thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Maybe just something to note, uh, the ISO has got a technical committee on tourism standards and um, there's another meeting in, in May next year in Cape Town and there are specific standards for uh, tourism in protected areas and tourist, responsible tourism accommodation. So I think it's important that a lot of us get involved in that process so that we don't get to the point. Thank you. And, and Kevin, how do you people get involved in that version of ISO? It's, it's managed through ISO, through technical committee, right. to two hours. So if you just contact ISO, they'll put you in. Thanks, Kevin. Any other comments or questions for Kevin? We'll be here all day. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you. in the session in the evening, I think it's next we finished. Um, but what I wanted to do is reflect a little bit on where we've come from and, and basically ask the question on where we should be going to. Um, um, so in um, four years ago, uh, in 2010, um, together with the Expo, we developed a, a strategy um, for until basically until this year for this Parks Congress. Um, and this covered four main themes, um, strengthening the institution, reinvigorating our membership and the types of outputs the groups was doing, contributing to the IUCN and WCPA events, organising member meetings, and also contributing to international meetings and conventions. And
And at, at that time, we developed the strategy with the Exco, but we also did um, a, a survey as well of the members that we had to see what they thought. So in terms of what we've done over the last four years, as I mentioned before, we have developed um, an Exco, um, which meets regularly every, every month we have um, a meeting where usually the majority of us can participate. Sometimes it's three different meetings at different time zones at different times. We try and stay in touch as much as possible. Um, we've started to, um, we've got some draft bylaws that are now um, in draft, so which basically talks about how each of the working groups are managed, how the membership is managed, um, what the, um, how the Exco is revised over time too. So um, it's not normal within WCPA groups to have any kind of democracy at all. We feel that it's important. So um, from um, next year, we're going to have the first um, elections of re-elections of, um, re of Exco members. Next year, it will be uh, capacity building um, and knowledge development will come up for re-election. Um, the year after will be um, the chair um, and heritage. And the following year will be communications and membership. Um, and the year after that. And if we have any other working group members as well, we know. Um, it is um, the, the the current members of those groups are allowed to be in line. We're not very strict on that, but we just want to make sure that it's open and vibrant. Um, okay, as Elena mentioned earlier, and I mentioned to you, uh, the membership we had a huge membership drive. Email and wrote to everyone we knew working with tourism in particular areas at the time and encouraged them to join. Um, and we've had a massive growth in membership which exceeded our targets from 18 to 266 members in four years. But one of our big challenges has been that a lot of those members are very, very quiet. So I, I think that the task that UFA um, and the other entities have done in, in the best practice guidelines for bringing together 54 collaborators on that is like a huge task and we'd like to do more of that. We're more of the membership, we're not just listening and seeing the emails that are coming through, but actually saying, well, this is something that's important in my world, and I want to work on this, and can we do something about it? Um, we are constrained that we don't have, like, a, a secretariat with funding, we, we raise money from different sources for best practice guidelines, and we try and put together our efforts to do that for particular activities. Um, another activities that we've been doing to reinvigorate the membership is get more services for members. So I mentioned before the Google Hangouts that Ron has been doing, uh, webinars. Um, Steve did one recently on the festival. We, we had an event on the TV special edition as well recently. Um, and, and Ron is very uh, organized at, at putting these together and encouraging people to work through. We also try and circulate um, important international documents for comment and invite our members and others to, to provide their contributions. So, for example, the, the draft strategy that David was talking about for the CBD, we circulated it to all our memberships through the Google group, we put the links on the Facebook site and encourage people to contribute. Um, but to be honest, some of the feedback has been limited. I think we maybe had three or four people feedback on that process. So we do need ways to make sure that we are getting important comments from the people who are out there and have this, this detail. Um, and then having this big online presence that we're trying to improve. And if you are here and using Twitter tonight, please remember to use the hashtag WPC Tourism. Um, so the third activity in our strategy was really to participate in IUC and WCPA events. We are a specialist group um, of the WCPA, and it's important that you know, we use that um, to our advantage. So as I mentioned here at the IUCN, there are um, over 80 um, tourism um, presentations and sessions taking place, which I think is really excellent. And again, really um, disappointing that it's not being seen yet as a core theme or stream. But quite frankly, we have the tourism journey, it's there, it's out there, it exists, and it basically is the best way of Robin mentioned the work on healthy parks, healthy people, um, and she and other members have been participating actively in those IUCN meetings. Um, every year there is an EXCO meeting of WCPA, and we've always managed to get at least one EXCO member to that. Usually the one that's geographically closest, so we don't use up too much problems. And in, um, in Jeju, at the World Conservation Congress, we also had a number of events. But as any of you who've got papers accepted here know, 
the process of actually applying it for a paper and getting it accepted is really hard and frustrating. You don't really know how to do it, and it seems like sometimes things are just being put down or something. Like I know some people that have got the same presentation three times throughout the Congress, and other people who didn't get accepted at all. It's just, it just just doesn't seem to right. So I'm hoping that, that people are going to learn from this Congress and try and write it for the next one. We've got another ten years to write. <laughs> so, in terms of we try and participate as well, other international level in meetings. Um, so, there was a CBD meeting in, in India where we had um, non MEDA participate in the tourism session. The recent um, CBD meeting as well, Julia Carbon, who's in our expert part from the IUCN secretary, she also participated. Um, we had um, a tourism and particular session at the World Travel Market in 2009. Then um, the, we had a, a presentation on Thursday from uh, our CEO from UND, uh, sorry, UNWTO on the 10 year uh, framework for planning. Um, and the TAPAS group is, is part of the multi stakeholder committee, sorry, multi advisory committee of that group, along with another others. So we try and provide them there too. Um, and in terms of the GSTC, uh, and we can provide. And every year we do an annual report to WCPM. We, we invite our, our membership to tell us what they've been doing, what they've been presenting, what they've been publishing, and we report that to WCPM. And the list of publications for our members is just amazing. I'm just so impressed by how industrious it is. So that's basically what we've been doing for the last four years. Um, and I hope you forgive us. As like I mentioned before, we are voluntary, we don't have any money, so everything being done here is without any money at all. Um, one thing I forgot to mention is um, our new logo, which is also officially being launched here at the meeting. This logo, yeah. So, I, in fact, Sue, do you want to say something about the logo? <laughs> okay. Would you, okay, well, Sue well, so basically very kindly <laughs> he used um, one of the um, marketing people that they have at Wilderness Safaris. Um, she donated some money from her pocket to basically get a whole series of logos designed. And, and then we had um, basically an online voting process. So we did an online survey. We had 66 votes for people about who liked which one best. And this was one that most people liked. And it came out very strongly. Um, and it was interesting because it wasn't necessarily the ones that us as individuals would have chosen, but this is the way democracy works, and I would rather have the one that everyone thinks is the best, what most people think is the best. Thing. So, at the moment we have the Survey Monthly open as well, and this is on the, uh, on the strategy. So, we want to know what our members and others think that our priority should be for the next 10 years. What should we do between now and the next part? So what should our objectives be? What activities we should be doing? We've heard from the group members what we've been doing on capacity building and knowledge development in particular. And I think we've probably been most active in terms of producing publications. Is that what we should still be doing? Um, which of the IUCN groups should we form the strongest linkages with? Um, in four years ago, as I started to outreach to all of the, the IUCN commissions and the task forces and the specialist groups, I emailed all of their chairs everywhere and I maybe got responses from about a third of them and that and over time that sort of trickled down to so I get discussion actively with maybe two um, and that's probably a, a failing on my part maybe not being active enough but there must be some of these groups that make very natural linkages with that we should work with and really try to do and who should our external partners be? We would mention GSTC, CBD, um, and, and the 10 year fund planning framework. Who should be working with more? Who are these partners who are working on sustainable tourism globally that can really enrich this volunteer network and different um, And so, really, now um, I'd like to invite you to, to fill in uh, on my phone, but also if you have any suggestions now. Any things, anything, if you're a TAPAS member, that, that's a good question. How many of you there are actually TAPAS members now? Okay, it's good that's about a third. How many of you are going to join? Yeah. That's good. I'm going to turn the camera around. 
Okay, that's great news. And also, Elena had a suggestion the other day. It's like each of, each of us, if each of us writes to three people we know who are working in tourism protected areas, and we suggest that they consider joining, that can, that's a huge amount of outreach. Anyway, just a thought. So, um, I'd really like to open the floor and um, welcome any suggestions. If you see what we're doing and there are things you think we could be doing better, are there any things? <laughs> okay, maybe you're too shy because the video is running, <laughs> or maybe because it's late. But then I would really welcome you to fill in our form. Uh, we'll keep it open until the end of the year, shall we? Yes, okay, until the end of the year. Um, and thank you very much. So finally, just in wrap up, I'd like to thank very much um, the business and biodiversity unit for hosting this session. Thank you very much again. Um, and welcome you to stay and chat and discuss, or, um, and, and come and speak to any of you if you have any questions. And we have some collateral here on the table, so please feel free to ask. Please take them. <laughs> Nobody wants to do them like that. Yeah, back then. Yeah, well. um, Elena's not here, but these are all of the. Sorry, you'll find. Oh, thank you. <laughs>